We have 20 minutes now. Uh, hello, can you see my presentation? Yes, we can. Yep. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, George. Um, I would like uh, to discuss about uh, electronic nanoscopy uh, in applied uh, research. Um, sorry. Yes. An outline, an outline of uh, my talk, I would uh, first uh, shortly uh, describe uh, what is the National Center of Scientific Research Democritus and the institute I'm uh, working in. And then I will present you uh, uh, with selected showcases uh, of applied research done in the lab uh, concerning pharmaceuticals company companies oil refinery, and then something a little bit different having to do with uh, nanometrology issues. So um, what is uh, the National Center for Scientific Research Democritus? Uh, we are in the suburb of Athens called Agia Paraskevi, in the uh, mountain, close to the mountain of uh, Imitos. Uh, the uh, campus is shown in this uh, image, and uh, NCSR Democritus has five uh, institutes. Nowadays, there is a sixth institute for quantum computing and quantum technologies that is just uh, signed and established, waiting for its director. And uh, what do we do? We are concerned with research in health and life sciences, environment and climate change, advanced nanomaterials and nanosystems, uh, ICT, security and big data, energy, ra radiology, nuclear technology, and finally with cultural heritage issues. Timoptos uh, uh, has about uh, 1,000 personnel, uh, 700 scientific and 300 administrative, technical, and support personnel. So, INN, the, one of the five institutes of uh, Democritus, the Institute of Nanoscience and Nanotechnology. Uh, what we do, we, our mission is to conduct basic and applied research in a wide range of physical, chemical, and engineering sciences with emphasis in nanoscience and nanotechnology. Uh, the Institute is the biggest in Democritus, has 77 researchers, assisted by 13 technical and five administrative personnel, and uh, a number of postdocs, PhD students, and master students. In this institute, there is the electron microscopy and nanomaterials uh, lab. Regarding transmission electron microscopy, we have uh, two microscopes. Uh, an older one that is uh, um, that has a thermionic LB6 gun, and but it is equipped with a GIF 200 um, attachment that can perform electron energy loss spectroscopy and energy filter TM. And uh, our new microscope is uh, a Thermo Fisher Talos F200I. Uh, field emission gun uh, transmission scanning electron microscope. It is equipped with uh, uh, a CETA uh, 16 megapixel camera. It has uh, a lot of uh, stem detectors, a high angle annular dark field, a bright field, and two dark field detectors, and also uh, a large uh, detector for uh, EDS, uh, Energy Dispersive X-ray Spectroscopy. This microscope is rem remotely operated so that uh, the operator, the user, does not intervene with uh, talks, uh, heat, and else as how uh, on the operation of the microscope. Now, coming to the showcases I would like uh, 
to show you. First, uh, the first example, the first uh, case study comes from the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, many uh, pharmaceutical companies are developing um, generic form of uh, already existing uh, original, as we say, products. Uh, one of them is ferric carboxymaltose. This ferric carboxymaltose is a complex, a mac macromolecular ferric hydroxide carbohydrate complex, and it is used for the treatment uh, of iron deficiency, deficiency anemia. It is used intravenously. So, what can we do about it? We have to compare two, two different products, the generic form and the original form. The first question is how they look like. They are, both are comprised of nanoparticles. These nanoparticles, as we will see later, have an iron core. So the first thing we have to compare is their morphology. As you can see here, you see that uh, you have single nanoparticles or agglomeration of an, an nanoparticles. If we compare the shape of the single ones, we see that in both cases, they have an ellipsoidal shape. And if we measure the dimensions of them, we can calculate what we call an S-plot. That's a plot that shows the cumulative frequency, how many nanoparticles have a particular size, a particular diameter. As you can see here, both the blue and the red, the generic and the original one, are within our experimental error, meaning they have the same S-plot. And what does this S-plot tell us? It tells us that we can calculate the polydispersity index. What is the polydispersity index? It's how many nanoparticles, 10% of the nanoparticles, have what diameter? What diameter they have the 50% of the nanoparticles? And what diameter they have 90% of the nanoparticles? By comparing these values, we get the D10, D50, and D90 uh, indexes that are very crucial for pharmaceuticals because uh, they are directly connected with the kinetics of the iron to the patients. So all, all the generic and the original form have uh, similar within experimental error, a polydispersity index and morphology. Then the next thing we would like to compare is the crystalline structure. So we, we show here uh, selected area electron diffraction patterns of the generic pharmaceutical and the original one. You can see that they are comprised of circles, meaning that our uh, products are polycrystalline. In particular, its core is single crystalline, but the average, uh, a lot of them make uh, diffraction, uh, they produce uh, diffraction rings. And if we measure the distance of its diffraction ring from the center, we can get the displacing, the interplanar spacing of uh, uh, our samples, of our products. You can see here in this table that the displacings are identical and they can be attributed to the crystal structure of acagenite. So the crystalline structures of generic and original products are the same. What else can we check? We can check the chemical composition. How? We utilize energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy. I would like to remind you what is uh, EDS, what is energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy. We have uh, an, electron, uh, an electron of the beam. This is a high energy electron. These are the levels, the atomic levels, energy levels of our uh, sample under investigation. 
and then an incident uh, electron ejects uh, an electron at some level. This is the K level, the K orbital. This electron can be ejected to the conduction band or can be ionized. And there's a hole left. So there are other electrons in higher states that would like to come to this uh, empty space, to this electron, uh, to this hole. And through this uh, transmission, due to uh, energy con con conservation, characteristic X-rays are um, emitted. We, when we measure these X-rays, we get this kind of spectrum. This is the intensity, and this is the energy of the X-rays. And let's say we have the, the K cell, the R, M, N. We can have transitions from the R to the K, from the M to the K, or the N to the K, and we call them K, A, 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 A alpha, B, B, beta, and gamma, or other, like uh, to L cell, and we have L alpha and L beta, etc. So these transitions are, have a characteristic energy of the element of the nucleus of uh, uh, being excited. So we see that for iron, we have K alpha and K beta, for copper, K alpha and K beta, but these are in different energies. So this type of spectrum can be used to pinpoint, to identify what elements are ex existing in our sample. And not only that, but we can, let's say, integrate the intensities, uh, do some calculations, and we can have the answer what element at which stichiometry exists in uh, our sample. By performing that in our two generic and original uh, products, we see that uh, they contain iron and oxygen, and the oxygen to iron concentration is 2.3, the atomic percent. The theoretical one of the ferric carboxymal dose is 2.25. So these are the same uh, within experimental uh, error, meaning that uh, the iron to oxygen ratio is the same, and this is very crucial for uh, our two products. Next thing we would like to investigate is what is the chemical uh, surrounding, what is the chemical environment of iron? And how can we do that? We utilized electron energy loss spectroscopy. Again, we have our beam electron, exciting electrons, let's say from the K cell uh, let, uh, to the conduction band, to some other higher, higher states. These electrons lose energy. What is the energy they lose? It's the energy that is required, required for the excitement of the original uh, electron of the K cell to the conduction band to other uh, empty states or uh, when they're ionized uh, to the vacuum. So we measure the, en the energy that the beam, the initial electron beam has, and we have a spectrum. We have the zero loss peak that represents most of the electrons. I remind you uh, that most of the electrons are not, do not lose energy. They're uh, elastically scattered, or they are not scattered at all in a very, very thin specimen in the TM. And then we have edges corresponding to transitions uh, of K or L, exactly the same as the ones examined in uh, uh, energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy, but now it's the primary effect. We don't measure the energy that is required for the uh, filling of the hole, but the energy that is lost by the electron, uh, uh, by the beam of the electrons. 
And if we have, if we measure the energy lost uh, uh, for iron, we get what we call uh, white lines. What is white lines? It's um, uh, the, uh, the result of uh, quantum uh, mechanics, meaning that uh, in when we have uh, uh, transition metals, uh, we have the spin, spin orbit splitting divides uh, in three states uh, the L cell. The L3 and L2, L3 and L2 represent electron transitions from P orbitals to unoccupied D orbitals, meaning that the ratio of these two edges is determined by the density of states of the D orbitals above Fermi level. So, this is a very sensitive probe of the environment of uh, iron outside the uh, iron atom. As you can see here, we compare the original and the generic L3 and 2 edges, edges, and we find that they are really identical, very, very similar. So, by summarizing, summing up what we have uh, done, we have compared two pharmaceuticals, one generic form, one in uh, the original form, and we see that they co are composed of iron nanoparticles that have similar morphology, size, or dispersity index, composition, as well as chemical uh, environment. We turn to another case. This case is uh, oil refinery. Uh, oil refineries have uh, a very um, serious uh, issue. This is uh, producing uh, chemicals, producing uh, uh, fuels without uh, high sulfur content. So they utilize desulfurization reactions. This project uh, had to do with the development of a highly active ca catalyst for such reactions. And uh, the background knowledge is um, that molybdenum disulfide crystals are very active catalysts. And basically, they are very active uh, when at, at the edge, at the edge of the, the crystals they produce. So we used uh, a chemical method, a chemical decomposition uh, method, in order to obtain more molybdenum disulfide crystals on carbon nanotubes and nanofibers. Uh, why we use carbon nanotubes and carbon nanofibers? Because they have a very high surface area, they have high conductivity and mechanical strength. So here you can see uh, the carbon nanofiber. And these black lines, these are TM uh, bright field images, these br black lines correspond to molybdenum disulfide nanocrystals. This is confirmed by the despacing among the layers shown here. They uh, are three to five layers, as you can see in this image. And by using ELS, electron energy loss spectroscopy, uh, we have the, we measure the ratio of molybdenum to sulfur that uh, is uh, 2.1, very close to the nominal value of 2. Now, you can see here a bright field image and two energy filter time images, meaning that we image the areas from where we have electrons scattered uh, losing energy corresponding to sulfur or molybdenum. So we map these two elements. We see that in the same places we find sulfur, it's the same place we have molybdenum. So these places correspond to molybdenum disulfide. And we realized that uh, molybdenum disulfide uh, highly covers, has a very high density in covering the carbon nanofibers. If we compare that to carbon nanotubes, 
we see that in, nano car in carbon nanotubes, we have single layer coverage, not um, as in the, yeah, thank you. Not as in, in the case of uh, carbon nanofibers. And we can better see that in these Z contrast stem images, where we can see the lattice of molybdenum disulfide, and here is the yields map showing sulfur uh, on uh, a carbon uh, nanotube. So, if we compare how density, what is the density on carbon nanofibers and carbon nanotubes, we see that in carbon nanofibers, the density is much higher. This is uh, the case where we use in the same solution both nanofibers and nanotubes. And why does this happen? Why molybdenum sulfide um, grows more easy on nanofibers? That has to do with the structure. In carbon nanofibers, we have what we call uh, uh, turbostratic, a defective structure. And this gives many sites that can uh, sites that can act as nucleus for the deposition of molybdenum disulfide. And how do we differentiate the turbostratic to the let's say uh, carbon um, ordinary carbon structure by performing yields and seeing that we have here a different uh, sp2 to sp2 plus sp3 um, hybrid, hybrid, hybridization. And this is the explanation of why, in this case, we have a higher and uh, density of molybdenum sulfide, and also they grow in uh, a few layers, while in CNTs and carbon tubes, they only grow as a single layer. And ending, I would like uh, to talk about uh, Metrology. I showed you, and many have seen, uh, many of you have seen uh, measurements concerning sizes uh, utilizing TM. But how can we be sure that uh, what we declare is the same if this is the same um, uh, quantity is measured in another lab? This is uh, the area where metrology comes in place. One very important issue is measurement traceability, meaning that we have to trace our measurements to international standards. What we're using have to follow the traceability chain in order to be referenced to um, national or international standards. And how can we trace that? We have to use reference materials and we have to calculate our experimental errors. You all know that we can have systematic errors or random errors. But uh, is this enough? No, it's not enough because the reference material, the reference size, it has an error in itself. So the while error is um, confined as true value minus measured value, the true value is not known. It's not actually known. It has an error in itself. So we introduce the uh, uh, uncertainty, uncertainty U. And this can be calculated in a various, in a, a small, uh, um, sorry, uh, plain way you know, through equations like this. So what, we did, we, uh, together with uh, the Hellenic Institute of Metrology, we developed a, uh, a protocol for directional, dimensional measurements. We have to be traceable, so we used reference material that was polystyrene nanospheres with diameter traceable to NIST standards. Uh, this is the American uh, Metrology Institute. We defined the sources of uncertainty because uh, they, these include the reference material, the image resolution, the microscope resolution, the user, because the user has a bias, 
and the thresholding level in our image uh, uh, processing. The procedure we used is we prepared the temp sample, we adjusted for uh, eucentric height because this uh, greatly affects uh, measurement uh, in the TN, minimized the hysteresis in uh, the temp lenses. I remind you that temp lenses are electromagnets. Uh, we acquired a series of bright fields, threshold the images, we measured nanoparticles, calculated the diameters, repeat all these steps for two or three users, and we calculate uncertainties and magnification. So, as you can see here, you can see the polystyrene spheres. We used uh, noise reduction uh, mean uh, average uh, uh, noise reduction method. So this image has reduced noise. We threshold it. You can see here the uh, rectangle enlarged from here to here and uh, the use of different threshold levels. We calculated the uncertainty budget. These are the parameters uh, concerning the uncertainty. And we finally arrived at a corrected magnification of 44.0 thousand uh, instead of the nominal that the microscope uh, indicates 46 uh, uh, times, 46K, 46,000 uh, times. The expanded are certainly calculated was uh, 2.5 uh, K. So by this, this method, uh, we can uh, assure, we can be sure what is the magnification that is correct. And more importantly, what is the uncertainty we have in our uh, measurements? Based on that, we have performed a round robin test uh, with uh, the um, uh, lab in uh, Thessaloniki, and we compared our um, uh, results. So, thank you very much for all you for the, your attention. Thank you very much, Nico. And uh, so now uh, we can go to questions. Uh, Okay, so I don't see any question. So maybe I can start. Uh, I found everything very, very impressive, very nice. And what I would like to ask is, I like those uh, molybdenum diselenite that you showed on the nanowires. Why is it that uh, turbostratic graphite uh, favors the nucleation of molybdenum diselenide, whereas if you have a, an ordered uh, structure, it's not favored. Uh, this um, has to do with, thank you, George, for your question. This has to do with um, uh, that turbostratic uh, pointing to the surface uh, produces defects that uh, are nucleus sites for per the precipitation of molybdenum, molybdenum disulfide. I remind you that molybdenum disulfide is uh, prepared by decomposition in a Leyla mine of a precursor uh, for uh, both for uh, molybdenum and sulfur. So it's a chemical reaction and it requires um, sites, nucleus sites. Tropostatic structure provides more uh, higher density of uh, nucleus. Uh, that on, on those uh, can uh, molybdenum disulfide can precipitate. Okay, very interesting. Um, okay, so what do you do? You ah, maybe there's a question here. Yeah, regarding the presentations, because there's a question by George Pandazopoulos. We will upload these uh, presentations in our website, so you can download them and uh, have them if you wish. And so now, um, 
Okay, so regarding this meteorological approach, what uh, computational tools uh, would be needed in the future to have a sort of an automated, uh, let us say, an automated uh, uh, imp uh, application of this approach? Um, the calculation of uncertainty uh, requires um, requires uh, let's say you have to calculate the uncertainty in every magnification of your microscope. This uh, can be done uh, by having uh, several users producing images, having the users uh, measuring the images. Uh, and they are all in an Excel file. It's very easy. If if you do the analysis, then the calculation is easy. Uh, if you are asking about uh, what uh, software we use for thresholding for automating measurement of uh, the material of the sizes, uh, in case of these nanospheres, we used uh, uh, the NH Fiji, the ImageJ. Okay. You can use a, any image analysis software. I mean, digital micrograph by Gatan, but uh, image is uh, freeware, so it uh, has much more uh, wide application. Great. So uh, thank you, Nico, very much. And so now I think we can move on to the thank you. third uh, presentation.